First, uh, I'm coming to you from Canberra and I wish to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of the land upon which I live, work, raise our family and who, from whose land I'm speaking with you today. Secondly, I want to thank Faisal and the team at MyBabble for the wonderful opportunity to speak with you uh, at this conference today. <clears throat> and my thanks to the technical team who's beaming me in uh, to the conference uh, from the other side of the world. <clears throat> Pardon me. So good morning, good evening from Canberra. My name is Phil McAuliffe and I'm here to share my lived experience of loneliness and some observations about my lifelong search to belong with you. The feeling that I don't belong makes me feel lonely. And lots of reflection shows that this feeling of not belonging is something that I've felt over most of my life. I'm sure that there were times when I did feel that I belonged when I was growing up, but they feel hard to remember looking back from this distance. <clears throat> growing up feels like I was in a near constant state of trying to fit in, to be accepted and to feel that I belong. I grew up in a tiny country town in regional New South Wales. It's a farming community and there are lots of sheep, wheat, kangaroos, and bountiful sky. The topography of the area is flatter than uh, your dining room table. And so there's a lot of sky. But most of the kids in my school were the children of farmers and they preferred being outside, whereas I preferred being inside. While they loved playing outside at recess and at lunchtime, I loved class time. I loved learning and I was a voracious reader in primary school. I would read books and pore over atlases and encyclopedias, eagerly absorbing the words about, how the, about the world beyond my immediate surroundings. I did play tennis and cricket, but I always felt like I was hopeless at, the, at those sports and it was often the last picked. But the boys at school and in my family were obsessed with one sport, Australian rules football. I hated playing Australian rules football or football uh, and thought that there was something wrong with me because I was the only one I knew who didn't really care what was happening. Plus, I had to play it because I was boys and a, a boy and boys had to play football. That's just how it was. It sounds trivial, but that was really important in primary school and I felt really out of place. Now, this cultural obsession continued all the way through my secondary schooling, but with the obsession level dialed up to 12. I was sent to a Catholic boarding school just outside of Melbourne, three hours drive away from my hometown. The school's nickname was the Football Factory for the number of elite footballers it produced. I spent six years of my secondary schooling hustling to fit in, trying so hard to care about the same stuff that the other kids I lived with cared about, football, girls, and later boozing and partying. I'd look around and think that all the other kids seemed to have worked out the secret to being included and being popular. I mean, I had friends, but it felt that the friendship often wasn't reciprocated. I lost count at the number of times a friend was having a party with say a limit of 20 people and I happened to be the 21st person on their list. But the cruel irony was that even if I did get invited to a party, I'd go and feel really out of place and that I didn't belong when I was there either. And on top of all of this sort of general awkwardness, I realized that I felt funny uh, around some of the other boys. But a Catholic boarding school in regional Victoria in the early 1990s wasn't a safe space to explore where I fit into any kind of rainbow community. It was far safer to shove those feelings down and pretend to like girls too. I always thought that this was how life was meant to be. I believed that I was always going to feel on the outer. I had some very dark times at school and I marvel now at how younger me got through those times. 
Despite that internal turmoil, I still loved learning about the world and was fortunate to have great teachers who fed my interests. <clears throat> Pardon me. I did well in my final exams and was accepted into a prestigious university. At that university, I was surrounded by people who had also been the smart kids at school. There were others who loved learning and using words and language as much as I did. And I thought that I'd found my place, but as classes commenced, I quickly began to feel like a fraud. The people around me were so smart, so accomplished, and so destined to achieve great things that I felt my presence was some kind of mistake. I went from being too smart at school to not feeling smart enough for university. I learned the power of achievement to help me feel that I belonged. I hustled and I hustled hard. I studied like a demon, but worked just as hard at making it all look effortless. I won awards, prizes and accolades for my studies, community service and my swimming. Turns out that while I hated football, I was really good at swimming. Uh, and uh, I cultivated the nice guy image. I was always quick with a joke and words of encouragement. I began working out at the gym and I felt great when someone noticed, you know, what I'd been doing in the effort, but and that recognition and respect for that effort felt really good. And all the while, the attraction to men was still there. I pushed it down as I'd made friends and was being accepted for the straight version of me that I was presenting to the world. Being gay was an inconvenient truth and that didn't fit with the image that I was trying to cultivate. Besides, it, I felt like I'd cracked the code. I simply needed to be smart, funny, buff, athletic, and simply a wonderful human to be around. Through recognition, I felt that I belonged until the glow from that praise wore off. And so I needed to do more and more. I graduated university and got a job in the graduate program of an important department in the Australian Public Service. I moved from Melbourne to Canberra. My workplace, though, was like university on steroids. I was surrounded by others who had worked hard at university and were wanting to do what was needed and expected and much, much more to get ahead in their careers. I employed my formula of being great at my job plus being the loveliest human both to look at and to be around. And it seemed to work. Over the years, I was promoted I got given important jobs. I got to live and work in Venezuela, Vietnam and South Korea as an Australian diplomat, doing important jobs in important places for my country. And I hustled hard to be the perfect person, the perfect boyfriend, becoming the, then, uh, becoming the perfect husband, then becoming the perfect father and all the while keep being the perfect son and the perfect friend. Again, I would feel that I would belong until the praise died down. When it did, I'd go back to feeling hollow and feeling like I was a fraud. So I'd have to then repeat that cycle. And then the formula that I'd used to achieve in life in my career since university stopped working. The thoughts and feelings of being a fraud were getting harder and harder to ignore. No amount of Cheryl Sandberg's advice to lean in helped. I pretty much leaned all the way in to almost be prostrate on the table, but that didn't even seem to work. Any praise I received felt hollow. I began feeling like I was adrift and lost. Rather than accept those feelings, I did what we all do when we desperately want our car to start. I kept pumping the accelerator and turning the key, hoping for the engine within me to fire up again so I could continue as before. Now, forgive me, let's go with this metaphor some more. I felt like I was a broken down car on the shoulder of a metaphorical freeway. And all the vehicles were speeding past me on their way to doing great things at great speed. And they were all too busy and important to stop. 
And as I sat in my car in the, on the shoulder of that freeway, I could no longer ignore the thoughts and feelings that I didn't belong. I knew that I needed to do something, but I was so scared. I was too scared to get out and go and prop open the bonnet to see what was happening within me. And I didn't want anyone else to see what kind of hot mess was under the bonnet because it terrified me um, and their judgment terrified me too. The hustle that I developed had stopped working. The thoughts and feelings that I now know to be loneliness, that I was unseen, that I felt unheard, flooded through me. Was this loneliness, my midlife crisis? I desperately did not want to be lonely. Loneliness seems so sad. Lonely people seem so clingy and needy. And the internet in 2016, when this was all happening, told me that loneliness was pretty much for the elderly and the bereaved. And I was neither of those. Besides, I was living my dream, right? I had a wonderful family, my wife and two kids, who I knew loved me. I was living in Seoul and doing a job that I'd loved. We lived in a beautiful apartment. Our children were attending the British International School and upsettingly were developing British accents. We were financially secure. I had friends and I had so many people surrounding me in my life. And while I had all these people in my life, I felt that I had no one who I could call and say, I need you to listen to me without feeling like I was intruding, being a burden or saying something inappropriate. I also felt like I couldn't speak up. I was surrounded by smart people who looked like they had everything under control and loved their work and their lives. So if, you know, I just felt so alone. The only person who wasn't or couldn't cope. And I felt that familiar separation from myself, from those around me from back in my school days. But something within me refused to accept any of this anymore. And it was my then wife who I first noticed, who first noticed that I wasn't being myself. She was a great support and helped me get out on weekends to do something that I loved. So I joined a swimming group and but this pe uh, petered out after a, a few months because while I love swimming, it's not something that you can do while talking. And besides, getting out to meet new people and explain myself to new people was just so exhausting. A few, a few weeks, months, sometime later, I called my employing agency's contracted counselling service um, and I spoke to a lovely person in Australia and she listened to me, but she responded with pity. And she told me what I could read from Google. And she said that I needed to find something that I love to do and put myself out there. She seemed to not really understand that out there was Korea. And she didn't understand that my situation, and not once, not once, did she mention the word belonging. Weeks went by and my funk deepened. And I realized that there, was, there were days when no one, absolutely no one, asked me how I was. Did I not matter? I felt so unseen, like I didn't belong. And on reflection, my strategy of projecting boundless competence and endless good humor I'd cultivated to get me through life to that point wasn't giving people around me much of a reason to ask how I was. I'd ask how other people were, but when they asked me, I rarely gave them reason to worry. I was always happy and life was always great. I really wanted to be seen and to be heard, but I did not want to be seen or heard at all. And that was the paradox of my loneliness. I was so scared too. And this terror ha uh, kept me from seeking out more help. More weeks passed. And to return to the car metaphor, a roadside assistance truck in the form of a men's coach stopped to see if I needed support to get going. Together, we opened the bonnet. We had a look to see what was going on under there. That coaching program was just what I needed. The program involved a lot of talking, involved a lot of sharing and listening to myself and to others. One word came to me 
began to come up within me and in conversations time and time again. Belonging. It, became, it came up when my coach asked me the question, this pivotal question. Do I believe that I'm worthy of love and belonging right now, just as I am? And the answer was no. I felt unworthy of love and belonging. Pretty heavy. I began to realize just how much the hustle to belong had ruled my life. I'd edited and molded myself to fit into some kind of amorphous definition of what I thought I needed to be to be accepted. And at the end of the program, and after a lot of hard work, I felt like I had stepped into myself for the first time. I did believe that I was worthy of love and belonging just as I am, gloriously and imperfectly awesomely me. I needed to know and accept myself and belong to myself before I could connect with others and the world around me. And this was a powerful feeling. I started to reach out to people in my life, both past and present, with whom I wanted to connect. Some people were too busy to spare time and others told me that I deserved my loneliness. This was hard to hear because I was putting the real me out there. Many more others though were thrilled that I wanted to connect with them. And the conversations that happened when we connected were beautiful. I was being me and I was allowing them to be themselves too. I was being seen and heard and I was seeing and hearing them. And I felt like I belonged. And life went on. But after a year of feeling much better socially, I realized that there was another aspect of life that I knew that I needed to sit with and allow myself to accept. My sexuality. Now I realized that not being me, all of me, was coming at a cost and I was paying the price. But I didn't know how I could be true to myself and not hurt my family. Then one evening, I read this quote from the late Dr. Maya Angelou, and it spoke to me with such clarity. You are only free when you realize you belong no place. You belong every place, no place at all. The price is high and the reward is great. And as someone who'd been on a lifelong quest to feel that I belonged, this really spoke to me. Dr. Angelou said that I belonged everywhere when I belonged to me. No one had spoken to me about belonging like that. And these words helped me summon the courage to come out of the closet. First to myself, and then secondly, I came out to my wife. Then later to our children when we made the tough decision to end our marriage. Then I came out to family and friends and then to the world. And I feared coming out for so long. I feared not belonging. I feared exclusion and judgment. I feared the words and the judgmental language that I could receive from those around me and the world. I did receive, and I still do receive judgment, but those most important to me have almost universally said beautiful things and expressed loving sentiments. But the judgments I have for myself have diminished dramatically. I'm now me in the world, and the connection I have with myself to those most important to me and to my communities, nourishes and energizes me. And the sense of belonging I feel within myself after I accepted me, all of me, the light, the dark, the bits I'm proud of and the bits I'd really rather the world not know about, is indescribable. There's an ease. My search for belonging wasn't a search for the right hobby, the right interest, the right job, the right contacts, the right friends or anything else outside of me. My search for belonging required me to go inside and find out who I am and why I am and then have the courage to be me in the world. I want to share a few important observations with you. I come out regularly for two reasons, for being gay and for experiencing loneliness. Coming out as either gay or lonely is always hard. I still fear judgment and exclusion. Coming out as either gay or lonely is always worth it. While hard, it is always worth it. I met my lovely partner, Jeff, because I came out as gay. Coming out as lonely has led me to being here with you this evening slash this morning. 
Connecting and feeling the belonging we seek can come when we accept and then learn from the parts we love and fear about ourselves. My work is all about helping others accept their loneliness, however it's been caused, and using it to then get the connection that they've been missing. Next, I know that I'm not the only person in the world who's been on a quest to find belonging. The hustle to feel that we belong can drive us to do great things. It can also lead to destructive behaviours, as many of you would know, within ourselves and when we're with those most important to us and in, when we're in our communities. You hustle to feel that you belong on some level too. Your hustle may be feeling worthy of sitting here in this room. Your hustle may be to prove that you're a good enough parent, spouse, child, sibling or friend. Your hustle may be in the hoping that your worthiness for love and belonging depends on reaching a goal weight, a promotion, a relationship or buying something. Whatever your hustle is, it's likely very exhausting and could be feeding your loneliness on some level. Please, from one human to another, stop a little while and remind yourself that you're worthy of love and belonging right now, just as you are. Loneliness can begin to shift when you know your worthiness and live from that place of belonging. Finally, and I'm getting the wrap up, where words are spoken and written about loneliness, note how they're almost always written and spoken about in the third person. It's easier to be objective and to not engage with the emotion of loneliness when the conversation is kept outside of us. My challenge to you is this. You are also to speak of your loneliness in the first person as you experience it, as well as the concept you're studying or working with. Our souls can connect with your human experience and our minds can connect with the concept you're talking about. But make no mistake, speaking of loneliness in the first person is tough. It's essentially coming out as lonely and it takes courage to come out and keep coming out as lonely. It's also very powerful. It's connective gold when used wisely. And your families, your friendship groups, your workplaces and other places where you gather with humans around the UK need that connection, just like they do here in Australia and around the world. So here I am. I'm Phil. I'm the loneliness guy. You can find me at thelonelinessguy.com on all forms of social media. You can send me an email after this to connect at thelonelinessguy.com. And you can listen to my words wherever you get your pods through my podcast connection over Coffee with the Loneliness Guy. I'm still prone to feeling lonely, but I now know that I belong to myself. That's a powerful feeling. Thank you so much for having me. I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much.